Hi, this is Andrea Kane, and we are now in week seven of our study in HSC 114, the lang medical terminology, which is based on the language of medicine, 12th edition by Davy Ellen Chabner. And we are looking at chapter 16 in our books about the skin chapter. Um, it is unit 12. If you're taking a look at your syllabus, it's unit 12. Our goals are to name the layers of the skin and the accessory structures that are associated with the skin itself. Um, we're going to look at our combining forms. In terms of pathology, we'll be focusing on lesions, signs, symptoms, and pathologic conditions. We'll talk about lab tests, clinical procedures, and then we will um, again go over abbreviations and medical terms. Your skin, if you could unzip it and take it off like it is a snowmobile suit, it weighs 8 to 10 pounds. It covers 22 square feet in the average adult. Can you imagine that? Amazing. It provides a protective membrane. There are skin glands that lubricate and cool the skin. There are receptors for sensation and it helps maintain your body temperature. So the skin system is really quite amazing. It produces sweat. Sweat glands produce a watery secretion that evaporates and cools. It cools your body off. It produces sebum. You have sebaceous glands that produce an oily secretion that lubricates the skin and hair. That keeps it from getting way too dry. It receives sensation. Um, if you think about your fingertips, you can sense pain, temperature, pressure, and touch. And not just your fingertips, but all over your skin. It has a thermal regulation ability where it can interpret a message from the heat center in the brain and then adjust. The structure of the skin is that you basically have three levels. You have the epidermis, which is the outermost. It's a very thin cellular membrane. Underneath of that is dermis, and that's dense and fibrous connective tissue. And then below that is your subcutaneous tissue, which is thick and fat-containing tissue. Have you ever heard of a sub-Q injection? It's an injection into that subcutaneous tissue. So your epidermis layer has basal cells, stratum, corneum, and melanocytes. And thankfully, they've given us a graphic on this <clears throat> so that we can see it. Um, I'm going to start with the bottom one first because that one makes the most sense to me. Um, the very top, you can see that top thin layer <clears throat> where the hair follicles are sticking out. You can see that that's your epidermis. It's very small, compact, thin. The next level is your thickest one, and that's your dermis. That's where you have these glands, these um, nerve endings, the hair root, and all of that. And then below that is another very small layer, but that's your subcutaneous layer where your blood vessels are, your, your um, capillaries, your arteries, veins, and it's, it's in a fatty layer of tissue, so to speak, um, cushiony area that cushions and protects your blood vessels. And then at the top, they've essentially taken um, a tiny slice out of the epidermis and dermis and moved it up so that you can see what the stratum corneum is, how you have keratinized or horny cells, um, then you have the basal layer with the melanocytes. All right, let's talk about hair. Hair cells are filled with hard protein keratin. That's what your hair cells are made up of is keratin. Your hair follicles are shafts that hold the hair. You have 5 million hairs on the body on average. I mean, people do. And only 100,000 of those are on the head. So if you think about that, that is incredible. Melanocytes at the root form the color. So if you're looking at um, color of hair, natural color of hair, it's from those melanocytes at the hair root. Most hair grows about a half inch or 1.3 centimeters per month and cutting does not affect growth. So let's look at what a hair fiber with a hair root and those melanocytes look like. 
pretty amazing. When you just look, if you've ever pulled a piece of hair out or had a piece of hair fall out when you brush your hair and you take a look at it, it doesn't look this complicated. But once you get it underneath the microscope, which I hope you have the chance to do at some point, it's amazing to see how all these things start popping up and you see how complex something even so simple as a piece of hair is. You have hard keratin plates that cover your toes and fingers, also known as nails. Um, that's the other place you have keratin cells, not just in your hair, but in your nails. In your nails, it's much harder. Um, there's a, a, if you look on the right hand side, you can see the cuticle, the lunula, or lunula, I say lunula, nail plate, and parenchium. Perinicium, I'm sorry, perinicium. You also have glands. You have sebaceous and sweat glands. <clears throat> and your a good way to think about it is sebaceous is oily, sweat is water. So um, your sebaceous glands, they're gonna that's gonna be into your hair follicles to lubricate them and keep them shiny your sweat glands are going to be to moisten and cool. So if you think sebaceous is, is oil-based, sort of like paint, sebaceous is oil-based and sweat is water-based. Um, they do different things. Unfortunately, they are both subject to bacterial growth, meaning that they can be attacked by bacteria and they can get infected. So what do these look like? And this gives you a nice graphic on that. You can see the difference between a, a pore for a sweat, for, for a sweat gland versus a sebaceous gland. All right, let's talk about vocabulary. Adipocyte or adipocyte. Albino. A person who's an albino, they've received two recessive genes and that has impacted their pigment causing a skin and hair color deficiency, which basically means they don't have much of any melanin um, for their skin or their hair. It can even impact their eyes, their eye color. Apocrine sweat glands are there. We talked about the basal layer, collagen and cuticle, dermis, eccrine, sweat gland, and your epidermis, epithelium, hair follicle, and tegumentary system, keratin, lunula, melanin. Perinicium, poor sebaceous gland. Sebum, squamous epithelium, and stratified. Stratum, and if it's plural, it's strata. Stratum, corneum, subcutaneous layer. And now we're on to combining forms. And um, as you know, our equation is combining root plus combining vowel equals combining form. Notice that there are two different ones for skin right here off the bat, and they are very different, cutaneo versus dermo. And dermato as well, so you've got three. Watch out for redness as well, because there's two there for that. Oh, whoops. I want to go back and talk about ichthyo, um, scaly dry. Notice the I-C-H-T-H, why? That is very unusual. So make sure that you study up on that. And here are more. And still more. Um, no, notice the word for wrinkle. Rithid. R-H-Y-T-H-I-D. 
make sure that you know how to spell that, all right? All right, which combining form refers to white, the color white? Because the truth of the matter is, is that there really is, albinism is the only, oh, I gave it away there, sorry, is the only way someone has white skin or white hair um, outside of aging to have white hair. Um, we all have melanin. We all have those melanocytes. And those determine the color of our skin and the color of our hair. And so really, we're shades of all these different colors um, that impact our hair and our skin. And they can change over time and they can change based on disease processes as well. So, um, you know, I know some people get very focused on skin color. But understand that that's a biological activity that's happening and going on. And sometimes that's related to genetics and hereditary situations. Sometimes it's not. And so we need to be careful um, not to make sweeping judgment statements based on someone's skin color or hair color or eye color um, because um, there could be something more going on. And really, it's a neat rainbow. When you look at it, it's a really incredible rainbow of colors that um, we all have for our skin, our hair, and our eyes. Truly beautiful. So which combining form refers to the same color as John Doe? Ooh, ooh, ooh. John Doe. I'll give you a hint. It's not cyano. <laughs> and okay, it's not erythro either, but I'll leave it to you to figure the rest out. All right, combining forms. This gives you, this is a nice way of putting, of putting colors and um, meanings and terminology together. But I would draw your attention to the fact that there are two, there are three for yellow, and there's also one for tawny yellow. There are two for black, and there are two for white. So it's, and, and in, they're used in different ways, so be aware of that. All right, cutaneous lesions. What are some things that can happen in that cutaneous layer? We can get crust or a scab, cyst, erosion, fissure, macule, nodule, papule, Pustule, ulcer, vesicle, and a wheel. The last one is spelled correctly, W-H-E-A-L, and it's pronounced wheel. I know it doesn't look that way. It's not the wheel of a car. It's the wheel of a cutaneous lesion. Here's an example of um, alopecia, absence of hair where it normally grows, alopecia. And that can be hereditary um, and, and genetic, as in male pattern baldness. And it can be something disease associated. So um, it's interesting to, to study some of these things. Ooh, what is this? It's a bruise, ecchymosis. Do you have any of you ever had an ecchymosis? Maybe you were riding a bike and fell off and you got an ecchymosis. Or maybe you bumped into something and got a bruise. These are blue purple marks that eventually change to yellow green on the skin and have to do with blood underneath of it. Petechia. These are small pinpoint hemorrhages and they are signs that there's something not right. Urticaria. That's an allergic reaction, urticaria. And that has those round, red round wheels on the skin. So if you've ever had an allergic reaction to something, um, you've had and you've gotten what's called hives. It's a type of urticaria. Acne. You may have gone through a stage where you struggled with acne. I think everyone does. Um, these are papular and pustular eruptions of skin with increased productions of sebum, which is that nasty old oil. But it's way too much oil. 
and um, it causes lots of problems, as you know. So I will leave it up to you. This is always a good thing to study. Burns. There are three types of burns, or three degrees of burns, I should say. A first degree burn, a second degree burn, and third degree burn. First is the least amount of burn, and that would be like getting a sunburn. Your skin gets red. A burn is an injury to tissue that's due to heat, chemical, electrical shock, lightning, or radiation. And this one shows a second degree burn, and boy, am I thankful they didn't show us a third degree burn because those are brutal. All right, cellulitis. That's a diffuse acute effect, infection of the skin, cellulitis. Um, you may have heard of that. Somebody's got an infection of their skin. It's caused that inflammation of the skin, and they might have to have an antibiotic to treat it. Eczema is also called atopic dermatitis, eczema. That's an inflammation of the skin that has these lesions that are related to allergy. Um, it can be anywhere on the skin. It doesn't have to be scalp, it can be face, it can be arm, it can be leg. Um, a lot of times these are very itchy and um, causes flaking and peeling of skin and just misery. And thankfully they've developed many, many medications to treat this. Um, but there is some question about whether eczema is somewhat autoimmune versus hereditary versus something else. So. Um, they're still working on that, and that's a great um, one to look up if you're interested in that. Exanthemous viral diseases. Um, that's a rash due to a virus. So let's say you got the measles, because rubella is measles, um, and you developed a rash from that. That is an exanthemous viral disease. Gangrene. I hope none of you ever, ever have gangrene. Is the death of tissue with loss of blood supply. And pretty much with gangrene, um, amputation is the only option. You may have heard of gangrene um, if you study history. Um, when you talk about the Revolutionary War, or you talk about the War of 1812, or the war between the states, the U.S. Civil War, that type of thing, there were a lot of wounds that they did not have antibiotics to treat that developed gangrene, and then they had to amputate. Impetigo, this is a contagious um, illness. It's a pyoderma caused by staph or strep. You definitely need antibiotics and you definitely need to stay away from other people. So if you know somebody who has impetigo, do not go visit and do not encourage them to have visitors because it is contagious and um, very miserable. Psoriasis um, has become more common. This is a chronic recurrent dermatosis that causes silver gray scales that itch, usually on the scalp. Scabies. Have you ever heard of somebody who has scabies? That is a parasitic because there's these little tiny mites that are causing it and it develops into an infectious paritis. And so that again has to be treated with antibiotics. You have to clean clothes, clean bedding, clean anything that they've been on. Um, so because you don't want that to get passed on either. Scleroderma is a chronic and progressive disease of the skin where your connective tissue hardens. And that's a good, another good one to read up on if you have an interest in that. Then we talked about systemic lupus erythematosus. We did this in our last um, lecture here for week seven, the muscular skeletal system. We touched on this. It's an inflammatory disease of collagen in the skin, joints, internal organs, and all of that. Um, there's a lot more to it than that, but um, that that is definitely something that does impact the skin. We talked about urticaria um, or hives. It's an acute allergic reaction where you get those wheels that develop on the skin. Um, some people get that um, if they get stung by a bee or if they take a medication that they have a reaction to. Here is tinea. It is an infection of the skin caused by a fungus. Tinea corporis is what is shown here. 
This is vitiligo, vitiligo. And this is a loss of pigment in areas of the skin. All right, so let's talk neoplasms. There are some benign ones like keratosis, leukoplakia, a nevis, or plural is nevi or nevi, and verruca. These are all benign skin neoplasms. Then you have cancerous neoplasms. Basal cell carcinoma is one of the most common skin neoplasms you will hear about. It's a malignant tumor of the basal cell layer of the epidermis. And most of the time for these, they can be removed. They don't ever come back. It's just, it's just a, a type of common cancer. Then there is squamous cell carcinoma, which is a malignant tumor of the squamous epithelial cells of the epidermis. This is more serious than basal cell. Kaposi sarcoma. This, when we studied the immune system, we talked about AIDS, HIV and AIDS. Kaposi sarcoma is a type of cancer that develops in AIDS patients. It is a nasty, nasty bit of work. It is malignant. It is vascular in that it gathers blood supply all around itself and it grows and there are cutaneous nodules with it. And this is definitely something um, that someone with AIDS has to be aware of and be checked for on a regular basis. Lab tests, there's lots. I mean, pretty much you take off a piece of skin or you take some fluid from um, something that's, that's on the body. Um, there are scrapings you can do, all sorts of stuff. There is cryosurgery where you destroy tissue with sub-zero temperatures using liquid nitrogen. If anyone knows anyone who's ever had a wart on their hand, um, cryosurgery is one of the easiest ways to get rid of those warts. Or if you've had what's called a skin tag, um, again, they can use this liquid nitrogen, put it on the skin. The extreme sub-zero temperatures just destroys the tissue and it falls off. There's what is called curatage, where they scrape it with a sharp curate. There's electrodesiccation, which you destroy it by burning it with an electric spark, which is sort of the opposite of cryosurgery. There's Mohs surgery, which removes thin layers of growth, and you, you put it underneath a microscope to take a look at it, and it's often used with basal cell or squamous cell carcinoma. Skin biopsies absolutely are done. Skin tests. Um, my daughter happens to be um, allergic to many foods, um, mostly fruits and vegetables, strangely enough. And we had to take her to Mayo Clinic and have her tested. And they did skin tests on her arms. And they actually took what looked like very, very, very tiny um, thumbtacks, so to speak, and they had the allergen in there and they put those on her arms. And then they waited 15 minutes to see how big the wheel was, measured it to identify then how badly she reacted to it. And it was very interesting. I took pictures of this and I would never share them. Um, but it, it was interesting to see what reacted, how it reacted. Um, her largest one was to English walnuts, and it was 12 by 22 um, millimeters. And her smallest was 2 millimeters by 2 millimeters, and it was to cats. So go figure. Um, and some didn't react at all. And those are the types of skin tests that you might have if you're trying to identify if you have an allergy because they can test you for grasses, they can test you for trees, they can test you for fruits and vegetables and all sorts of stuff. Dust and all types of things. All right, on to abbreviations. Did you know there was one for A, B, C, D, E? 
you'll probably never see this unless you work with a physician um, who works with melanoma patients. And if you're in an oncology office and you're working with someone who works with melanoma patients, you will see ABCDE, otherwise you will not. All right, let's see if there's any others here. Not seeing any that we really need to focus on. And on to our good old combining forms, where it's a combining root plus a combining vowel to equal that combining form. Again, we have three for skin. Two are listed here, and one is listed on this page. Notice the two for redness. All right, and we keep on going. And now we have some suffixes. All right, that's it for the skin chapter. We may managed to make it through much more quickly than the, multi, the musculoskeletal chapter, but there was a lot there. All right, this is video two out of three for week seven. I will be back shortly and we will talk about the eye and the ear. All right. Take care. Talk to you again soon.